Welcome to the Last Drinks Podcast. I'm your host, Will Hitchens. And today, it's just me. I don't have a guest. And as we know, Mitch is off gallivanting around Southeast Asia. So I'm going to try something different and just talk to the camera um, about me. It feels like some weird, obscure therapy session. And my listeners are my therapist, maybe. Um, but I am going to talk about me, which sounds kind of arrogant and narcissistic, but I guess as we will progress with this, um, this episode, it'd probably be anything, but maybe it's just a journal entry that I'm inviting the world to tune into, but I am going to talk about mental health. I'm going to talk about my um, journey with mental health, um, my sort of experience with it, my struggles with it. Um, I'm partaking in an internal battle, which I have to engage in, um, if I want to continue to progress through this journey that we call life. And I'm assuming that plenty of people, some of you might be listening, are also, um, partaking in a, in a somewhat similar sort of journey or experience like myself. Um, I call it the battle of I against I. Because I often see myself as my own worst enemy. You know, a lot of my struggles are what goes on in here. My head's a bit wonky. Um, you know, and mental health is is a is a is a tricky thing. It's a complex um, subject to tackle. There's no one right answer. It's very subjective. Um, you know, I'm trying to see, can I fix it? Can I overcome it? Um, is there a way to, you know, it for it to stop, you know, I mean, or is it a part of life? It's part of the waves of the ocean of life. It's just, you have ups and downs, you know, or am I just trying to find better useful tools to put in my arsenal that I can use when the storm hits, you know, I guess for me this year, it feels like it's been storm season all year um, to an extent. Um, so it's been challenging. And I guess like my journey with, with struggles with mental health. Um, yeah. It, it, it's for as long as I can remember. And I do think it's great that our society is moving in a positive direction with it in regards to having open dialogue and discussion around mental health issues. And to the point where people are, you know, putting to the forefront of their lives that an important value to them is having good, stable mental health and mental well-being, which I think is great. But for my own journey, um, like I guess I was getting into was, you know, like I was diagnosed with, uh, clinical depression in my early twenties, um, which I kind of think stemmed from this relationship breakdown that I had, um, where, you know, I was unfaithful, cheated on my partner numerous times. I don't even know how many times I did not a proud moment, but it was a reflection of who I was at the time as a person. Like I just, I was completely out of control. I had no self-control and, you know, I had no standards, no boundaries, no morals or values to set upon. I didn't learn about any of that shit until I fucking went to rehab for God's sake. <laughs> but, and it's been funny, I guess it's been interesting, um, whether it's been having conversations with our guests on this podcast or having chats with people in my personal life where like a relationship breakdown is a real make or break moment for so many people. It, it really, you know, can cause, have a real cause and effect for a lot of people. Um, you know, uh, you know, that traumatic experience of a relationship falling apart can, can really, can veer you into whichever direction. Um, and for some people, they take that experience and they use it as fuel to the fire and they erupt and they become bigger, better, bolder, stronger versions of themselves from that experience. I mean, for me, I'd say uh, it was the complete opposite. So when I was caught out for cheating, 
and the ramifications of what I'd done had set in. And yeah, you know, I broke this woman's heart and you know, the pain I caused her and then which then led to the pain I put on myself internally, you know, the guilt, the shame, the embarrassment, my self-worth and self-esteem just fucking plummeted to the point where I just thought I'm a garbage human being. What's the point in living anymore? I don't deserve to live anymore, you know, to be that drastic, you know? So that sort of um, decline led me winding up in doctor's offices where I was uh, diagnosed with depression, given antidepressants and then sent off to therapy. And I'd like to say that I had um, positive experience with antidepressants, but that my only problem was I was still drinking heavily um, at this time because I basically just made a decision where if I wasn't going to voluntarily check out myself because I didn't have the guts, um, I was just going to leave it up to chance and just fucking send it and drink as much as possible to escape and to numb out feelings I didn't want to feel anymore. And whatever happens, happens. If I didn't wake up the next day, then it is what it is. So be it. That was kind of where I was at. Because I was kind of at a point where I just didn't think I deserved a happy life. I didn't think that there was much of a life um, for me. I didn't, I didn't think I, I added any worth to the world, you know. And that lasted for a long time, you know. I guess I spent a big chunk of my life just doing things for the sake of it or just, you know, in particular, just working jobs that I had no passion for, no interest in doing. But I kind of saw it as this trade-off to existing was this, well, you're here, you have to contribute, so go work something to make money, you know. You have to exchange your time for money in some form um, and the possibility of being able to exchange your time for money doing something that you enjoy doing seems such like a far-fetched concept to me and something that maybe you had to work really hard for. And um, yeah, it's a huge mountain to climb. So it puts you off ever sort of starting the trek off the mount, starting the trek up the mountain in the first place. So especially when you didn't have any self-confidence or self-esteem. So I was navigating through that time, just um, wasting away um, in a grippling addiction to alcohol and being sort of struggling with depression. But I got to, I remember getting to a point where, I mean, this this was a vision I had, was kind of like a hope. Um, this before I went to rehab and it was before I asked my mum for help, I used to watch a lot of content. Um, actually, I used to watch this TV show intervention and the premise of it was, you know, there was a family and they had a, had an addict in the family and it basically followed the addict as it was going through its, you know, the addict was going through their turbulent disarray um, mess of a life, whether they were addicted to drugs or alcohol. So they followed them for a bit. Then there was an intervention with the family and then the addict went and got help. And then it was happily ever after. I made it sound like a Disney fairy tale, but it was probably anything, but so I'd watch stuff like that when I was, you know, in grips of alcohol addiction, but then I'd also watch um, YouTube videos on celebrity sort of uh, comeback recovery stories from addiction. And it was a similar sort of thing, you know, talk about, yeah, I was in a really bad place with drinking and drugs. And then I had a wake up call or a rock bottom, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden they turn their lives around and now they're fucking thriving and they're these just huge success machines and just killing it at life. And, I had this vision, I had this hope where I wanted to believe that, you know, drinking alcohol was was the one thing holding me back from me reaching um, my potential or like the moment I'd quit drinking alcohol is when it would all fucking, it would all fall into place. Everything would make sense. You know, I just had to give up alcohol and then uh, a purposeful, fulfilling, joyful, happy life was waiting for me on the other side of that. I just had to get through that and just quit drinking. 
that was the one thing I needed to do. And, and to be fair, look, I mean, I can paint the picture of my life that what my life was like when I, um, coming to the end of my drinking before rehab, you know, like I was burning through my savings. I had about a couple of thousand dollars left. I didn't have a driver's license. Um, I didn't have a job. I, um, you know, had strained relationships with friends and family. I didn't have a wife, didn't have a girlfriend, didn't have kids. Didn't, I didn't, I didn't own a home. I didn't have anything much to my name. And, you know, by metric, by quitting drinking, I have gained quite a lot, um, of things since then, for sure. My life is completely 100% better than it was when it was drinking. But I guess for me, if I can get um, stuck in unconscious negative thought patterns that arise over years and years of being, um, uh, I guess, in repetitive dep depressive loops, I can sometimes um, veer away from the stuff that I do have and then start focusing on the stuff that I don't have and then start feeling bad about that. And then, you know, all it takes is for someone to come along to point that out and say, well, you should be grateful for what you do have because there are people out there who would kill for what you have. Thus then me sort of spiraling again, because then I feel like crap because I don't have these sorts of these things but then I'm being told that I should be grateful because of the stuff I do have. And then I feel bad for the way I feel. And it's just, you know, this, it's this endless cycle of just um, headaches and, and misery. But so I went to rehab um, and then did a three week program twice because after three weeks I was not ready to leave. And so I did it again. So after six weeks, I eventually uh, left rehab and, basically try to rebuild some form of a life, come to some sort of normality, I guess. And my main focuses were making money. So I went back to work as an Uber driver. So that's what I was doing. Um, and then I wanted to sort out my health and fitness, I guess. And like I, I've started by just going for walks then eventually sort of uh, running on the treadmill. And then I got back into the gym and, um, but the main thing was diet. I really had no sort of structure with my eating. Uh, I never really sort of knew anything about nutrition. I guess I kind of know the basics now. I wouldn't say I'm an expert in any metric. Um, and this is the result, I guess. You know, I went from 120 kilos to 93. Then I've sort of fluctuated in and between um, due to sort of getting into weight training. Um, but yeah, like I guess this is the result that... You know, for me, it's like, yeah, it's fine. I guess if I had like a, a PT and a nutritionist, I'm sure I could elevate and improve, a hundred, you know, improve tremendously. But I guess my attitude is, oh, well, this is what works. Let's just keep doing this. Um, so, yeah. And post rehab, you know, seeing a psychiatrist, but then they also prescribed me more antidepressants. So when, during sort of before rehab and I was, I was trialing out all sorts of different um, antidepressants, but obviously they weren't sort of going to have much of an effect because I was drinking the entire time. You know, I'm sure plenty of doctors would have said to me, I think probably even my parents as well. So it's like, look, you're not going to get the effects of these antidepressants if you keep drinking, you know, but what the fuck do they know? <laughs> so then now that I'm sober, you would think, well, now you've, you've gotten rid of the alcohol. Now you can start to, reap the benefits of these antidepressants um you know when i was taking two a day i was taking two different ones it took one in the morning and one in the in the evening and again like this is just my experience i really didn't um you know reap the benefits of antidepressants i don't know it part of me just thinks that antidepressants are good for if someone's really down in the dumps they're in the dark and they're ready to check out taking antidepressants might lift them back up to some sort of neutral um, level, but it's really not like a long-term solution. I think the unfortunate thing is we have to sort of dig into, I guess, the pit of our existence and sort of deal with the issues inside that we buried down, which I guess for my case, I buried down with fucking alcohol and um, which other other things, but Cause yeah, like I was doing these things, you know, I had this goal to, 
to to work and save money to go travel Europe. And then I was fixing up my diet and exercising. And you think, okay, well, this stuff should really sort of improve my mood. And it really didn't. My only two moods really were just nothing and shit. It was just, I would feel flat and nothing, gray and shit. And then I'd just feel crap. So it was kind of like a trade-off. It was kind of just like, well, are those my only options? And that's kind of what's been implanted in my brain even to today. It's just, I would rather just feel nothing. If those are my only options in life, it's just like, well, you know, you can feel happy. And it's just like, it's, it's really few and far between or even trying to recognize when I'm actually joyful, you know? And, you know, for the longest time, that was kind of my goal. I just like, I just want to be happy. That was my goal. And that's really not a healthy goal to have because yeah, you'll be constantly fucking not happy and then feel like you're failing. So I had to get rid of that goal. Um, Cause yeah, you can't be happy all the time, but which I've accepted, but you know, I guess I'd like to, to not feel as unhappy I would like to not feel unhappy more of the time than I feel happy, <laughs> if that makes sense. So that was going on. And, you know, the doctors were like, okay, well, let's try something else to um, help with your depression. So they suggested a treatment called TMS, which is uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. I did have to look it up because I couldn't remember. Um, and basically what that is, is like I was laid on a bed and then they drew like a little dot. I think it was around sort of the start of my um, hairline on my forehead. And I'd lay down and they put this machine over me and then it would just start tapping on your forehead for about, I can't remember, like five or 10 seconds. And it would stop for maybe a minute or two and then it'd do it again. Stop, do it again, stop and so on. I think it went on for like 20, 25 minutes, 20, 25 minutes. And basically, it's supposed to activate nerve cells in your brain and then help alleviate some symptoms of depression. You know, I guess if you're open to trying anything, that was kind of a suggestion um, by my doctors. And the only issue I had with that was the fact that I had to go back into rehab as an inpatient. And at the time, I was very reluctant and re resistant to do that, mostly because I had these goals um, that I was working towards with my health and fitness and, you know, finance goals of saving money and working. So I felt productive doing that. I didn't feel productive going into um, back into the clinic again to do this treatment, like to just fully be honed in on that, which, you know, for some people listening, it's just like, well, this is your mental health at stake. Why don't you sort of put that as a high priority and, I guess to try and sort of explain it, like I didn't really have, I still don't really have high hopes for my mental health. <laughs> you know, I don't put it high up as a priority because I've been in a depressed state for long enough where it's just, I just kind of accept it. And when you get in the state like that, having high hopes that, you know, this is going to cure, cure you is dangerous, you know? Um, it's dangerous to think that because, yeah, like what if it doesn't work? Then you're just disappointed. Then you have to deal with um, the the mental pain that, that proceeds. And I've always said like my mental and emotional pain for me is so much more severe than physical pain. Like to get sidetracked, I remember uh, I did a, did a workshop. Um, it was a couple of months ago and we did some breath work. And in this particular style of breath work, a lot of sort of energy just came up for me and it just got so unbearable that I just started bashing the ground with my fist. And I mean, even to, still to this day, like that still feels rough. It still feels a bit odd to move my thumb like that, but that was just bashing it down like that. And I mean, my hand sort of swelled up uh, for about a week afterwards. It was all bruised, but like I didn't f really feel that at all like the emotional, mental sort of um, energies that were passing all through my body was what was aggravating me and making me super uncomfortable um, a lot more than what was happening here. And so, 
Yeah. And then so to come back to this TMS treatment, you know, where I was just reluctant and resistant, you know, because it's like I've accepted my fate and I was, you know, but then I did go in, but the whole time I was in the facility, you know, I was just miserable. I was just, you know, angry and frustrated and pissed off that I had to be in there. You know, I'm in a facility trying to help my depressive symptoms, but at the same time, I'm creating more depressive symptoms by being in here. So it was just an endless cycle. We eventually got to some agreement where I was able to do it as an outpatient. So at least I could continue doing these things whilst um, I could then sort of try out this treatment um, as an outpatient, you know. And again, I would sort of preface that um, I guess, you know, I could, I could probably could have... Um, had better sort of strategies with that at the time, but you know, it is what it is. Um, so the other things that I was doing, well, one of the other things that I was doing at the time, besides I guess doing this treatment, taking the antidepressants, seeing a psych psychiatrist, um, was I went to outpatient support groups. I was also going to AA and but I guess with AA, I only used to go to ID meetings. And if you haven't been to an AA meeting, um, ID meetings are the ones where you get up and you go, hi, my name is Will, I'm an alcoholic. And you basically relay your origin story of being a massive pisshead and then to the super sexy sober cunt that you are today <laughs> and, and then everything in between. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a good meeting to go to um, to just use as a tool to sort of reinforce um, the notion that, what you're doing, making a change by quitting drinking is a good idea. And, you know, there is some relatability in listening to other people's um, experiences and have some commonality. But I was also going to these um, outpatient support groups and there was many different ones, but the main ones I went to, there was an addicts one. And I also went to a men's group. And this was the first time I'd been in sort of like a men's group sort of environment where it's just, yeah, a circle of men talking and opening up and, I guess, sharing what they're going through. Um, and I guess I do it a lot now since joining the Brotherhood this year. And I can really sort of promote um, the benefits and how important I think it is for men to have men-only spaces to sort of come together um, in a safe environment and sort of express what they're going through um, in the presence of other supportive men. Um, I don't know whether there's been like a negative stigma in our society for men to go off in their own space without women, you know, cause I could probably say to the same effect that I'm sure that women have women only spaces where they do similar things and it probably works great for them. It just seems that women are more open and um, willing to sort of explore sort of, getting together and opening up and um, expressing themselves to one another and supporting one, each other. Whereas I guess men, there's probably a lot more resistance to, I guess, how they'll be perceived in this, you know, we've got to be strong sort of don't show any weakness, that sort of thing. And it's not really even about that. I mean, there is power and vulnerability. Um, and connection comes from that so i i can't recommend it enough and i think absence makes the heart grow fonder you know i don't think men and women need to be together all the time i think we can go away go away from each other and come back with a stronger bond <laughs> trying to get deep probably not working but so that was that was kind of my introduction to to being in just a men's group and i thought it was really good but i do remember in one of the sessions, the doctor said who was facilitating it, he was talking about drinking and he was talking about how um, when you drink, if you drink too much, uh, the part of your brain, I don't know whether it's the frontal lobe cortex or the, it's definitely not the hippocampus. They're the only sort of brain terms that I know. But basically, the part of your brain that does rational thinking and decision making, it goes to sleep if you drink too much. Um which I found interesting because it kind of light bulb went off. It's like, well, that makes sense. Cause you think about when people say shit, oh, you, 
you tell us how you really feel when you're drinking or you're your honest self when you're drunk or after a few drinks, you know, you, you blurt out just, yeah, how you really think, you know, and I think about all the dumb shit that I've said and all the offensive remarks and stupid jokes that weren't funny and all the dumb shit I've done. Like I would never do any of this shit sober. Cause like, this is what would happen when I'm sober. A stupid thought comes up. It comes around, gets to my rational thinking part of my brain and decision-making part of my brain, ready to be processed. It goes, do we say this? What do you think? And the rational part of my brain goes, fuck no, that is fucking awful. That is the stupidest thing that has ever come through this fucking brain of yours. Send that thought back to the archives and lock it away. We never want to see that shit again. That is fucking awful. Send me something I can fucking work with and be a bit more civil. And then the next thought comes over and it's a bit more civil. Okay. We can let that one go through. Because then when that when the rational part of your brain goes to sleep when you've been drinking too much, that stupid thought comes through. And because the rational part of your brain is closed for the night, it'll just go straight past it and it just comes out like word vomit, verbal diarrhea. <laughs> and then you just end up dealing with the consequences and then having to bloody fucking apologize immensely afterwards. Because <laughs> you think, I like to think, you know, think about all the stupid shit people do and say when they're drunk. Oh, this is this is how they really think. It's like if people did and said the shit that they did and said when they were drunk, when they were sober, we would live in a really chaotic society. Our society would be in absolute strife if that was the case, one hundred percent. So, um, and it's funny, just talking about that, it brings up, um, it brings up, it brings up a story for me in relation to this, um, I'd say, I'd call it, it's one of the worst things I've ever said. Um, when I've been drunk, it's not an excuse and it's not a cop out, but you know, it doesn't, it, the cards are stacked against me, I guess. But anyway, so this is one of the worst things I've ever said. Um, it was 2015 and I was in New York city and I preface, um, it's very important to this story that you know, that I was in New York city. Um, I was traveling America for a couple of months and um, this is back when I was drinking. So it was, you know, a lot of escapades, a lot of nonsense. And I wound up in a, in New York. I was staying in Brooklyn. I was in a hostel. There was a bar downstairs and I got frequently drunk in the hostel bar and made friends with some of the bar staff. And then one of the bar girls, she was a performer. I forget if she was a singer or if she was a rapper or both. It was, let's just say performer. And she mentioned she was going to a um, open mic in, in the area and invited me. Now I, I've been making social media comedic uh, videos for a while on Vine, possibly at Snapchat at this point, maybe Instagram. Um, you know, I wouldn't categorize intimate internet comedian and stand-up comedian in the same box. I think they're both very different um, mediums. You know, they might have similar titles, but I think, you know, the way that they um, create their uh, jokes, you know, might not operate the same way. But so I'd never done stand-up comedy before. And it's, this is the one and only time that I guess I've ever really done it. But, you know, no rational brain, no rational decision making. I just think, fuck it. Yeah, let's just fucking do it. Let's go. I'm ready. I've got the liquid courage all through my system. Let's go. So I think I remember we rode bikes there from memory. I don't know where the bikes came from. But anyway, we wound up at this bar and the bar was in the front. And then out the back was where the open mic event was happening in, a, in another room. And we get in and it's, it's mostly empty chairs. I think there was less than a dozen people in there. I can't remember any of the other acts and what they were doing. I can't even remember what the bar girl that I went with, what she was doing. Um, I get up there and again, I don't really remember anything else I said. I do remember I said this um, in a room in New York City. Remember, that's important. Um, so I got up there 
And I said, oh, I'm sick of you Americans, you know, asking me, am I still upset about the death of Steve Irwin? You know, like I'm not coming up to you and asking, oh, are you still upset about 9-11? Um, so to clarify, rational thinking brain comes in. I just compared the accidental death of one Australian. Mind you, he was an Australian icon. Mind you, you know, he was a bit of a risk taker and a bit of a thrill seeker. Nonetheless, his death was an accident. We still haven't forgiven the stingray. I compared the death of one Australian icon to the deliberate murder of about 3,000 Americans. And not only that, it's an event that, you know, changed the course of our recent history to the, to the, the effects of, you know, anyone that was alive during that time. You could go up to them and ask them, where were you on 9-11? they'd probably be able to tell you, you know, I can tell you where I was on 9-11. I was 11 years old and I was going to a chess tournament. Like that's the significance of this awful, tragic event that occurred on September 11. And so in my brilliance as a, a drunken idiot thought that was a good comparison. An Australian icon, accidental death, one person. Deliberate murder of three thousand Americans, not to mention you know, the, the 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 deaths that that came from that, from all you know, everything that transpired after that. But yeah, so I thought that that was one of the worst things I've said um, when I've been drunk, <laughs> and I don't have a leg to stand on. Um, but you know. I don't remember what transpired after that. I I can't imagine. I didn't I didn't remember getting my head kicked in. More or less I'm I'm still alive, so I managed to get out of the country alive at least with that. So maybe I'm just I'm making it a bit dramatic. Um I think you know it was a poor attempt at, at some dark humor. But um but you know sometimes the Americans have a good sense of humor. Um all all 10 of them that were in there that night but to to continue on with the um saying stupid things when you're drunk like i mean i used to uh, do that a lot and one of the ways i do that was yeah with the social media content i mean i used to make when vine was stopped would shut down i then went to snapchat i believe and you know i don't use snapchat anymore because i'm over the age of 30 i think if if you're a man over the age of 30 and you're using snapchat grow up um and if you're asking women for snapchat jesus christ come on pull your head in if you ask for a phone number if... <laughs> um yeah so yeah so i used to make content on snapchat i guess and a lot of it was awful a lot of it was not funny a lot of it's just downright embarrassing and I know this is because I've got archives of videos on my computer that I've looked at from time to time. I've even posted some on my Instagram as sort of like a reflection to show how far I've come now. Like, fuck, you thought you think I'm weird now. Look, look how I used to be. And yeah, um, it's it's tough to look at. I I really don't even recognize that person anymore because a lot of the things that I used to think were funny or um, the stuff that I used to get worked up about, like I just don't anymore. And I mean, I guess that just shows the growth of the person I've become. And hopefully it inspires me to look forward to the person I can grow to become, you know, in another five years. But I used to think that, I guess, during that time that I was really funny and entertaining and people really liked me because I guess I got a lot of traction and an audience by creating these silly things. And I don't know whether that was, or maybe people just like watching a train wreck. You know, we do like watching people's lives fall apart. We get sort of entertainment out of that to live vicariously through the misfortunes of others. We are quite a sick society. And there's a part of me that looks at that and thinks maybe people would watching it and thinking, well, at least I'm not as fucked up as this guy. Is this, this fucking idiot, you know? Um, or that could be my assumption. You know, I read the four agreements, um, 
not too long ago. And one of the agreements was don't make assumptions, which was also pointed out to me by someone that I do quite a bit. Um, so I'm consciously aware of it, but it doesn't mean that I'm not, um, you know, all over it. And then also like the types of uh, content that I used to, um, a lot of the jokes were self-deprecating and that's part in, I think, I think that's partly because a lot of the stand-up comedy that I used to watch was self-deprecating. Um, I'm a big fan of stand-up comedy. That's probably what led to the inspiration to start making sort of comedic videos online. Um, but yeah, like a lot of it was self-deprecating. It was at the expense of myself. I was the butt of the joke. I didn't really care about myself as long as people laughed at my expense, who gives a shit, you know, that sort of thing. And I guess some of the comedians that I liked, you know, that was their humor. Their humor was self-deprecating, but their self-deprecating humor was making their lives successful. Whilst for me, it was destroying it, you know? So I'm trying to be more consciously aware of the way I speak about myself um, because, yeah, like it is... It's like if my brain is like a punching bag and then all these negative thoughts are just these little jabs, little jabs here and there, just punching at the punching bag that is my brain. And you feel it. Like I do feel it. Like it does take its toll after a while. Um, and I mean, another thing I used to do, um, which is I'm not proud of, was... I would react emotionally pretty quickly to a lot of things. So whether it was someone said something that pissed me off, uh, some, you know, I'd see something online that, you know, triggered me. Someone would say something that triggered me, you know, that sort of thing. I would react emotionally very quickly, especially if I was drinking where everything sort of heightened and you're just quick to respond. Cause I thought that that's what you had to, you had to respond. Um, instead of processing, well, what is this that I'm actually feeling? What is it that I'm actually, um, uh, what is actually going on. And so a way that would come out would be like, I'd verbally berate people. I'd say I'd purposely offend people. I'd try and hurt people. Yeah. Just with, ver with verbal abuse. And sometimes that took in the forms of um, just messages, um, whether it was on social media or if it was in like text messages. And, and I mean, one of the things that I used to do, in part with that was because, you know, I had, I had a habit of blacking out, um, not remembering what I did the night before, you know, so I would get into these, these, these arguments with whoever I was, you know, pissed off at and just berate them and just abuse them verbally. You know? And I would delete the text messages, <laughs> wake up the next day. Oh, I don't, I don't remember what happened and there's no evidence of me sending anything like this. It's just my, it was just like a coward's way of absolving myself of any accountability or responsibility for the, for my actions. And, you know, Oh, just, there's no consequences. That was my way of trying to deal with um, my out of control behavior. Um, well, I'll just um, delete the evidence when, you know, I might have thought I deleted the evidence, but, you know, it would still be on their devices and they would still be on the receiving end. Um, and I, you know, I don't have any contact with some of those people anymore. I don't think. Um, but it, yeah, it's not, it's not something I'm proud of and it's not something I, yeah, like I don't feel good about it at all. Even thinking about it now, I just yeah, I feel awful. Um, mm -hmm. Especially, I, I mean, I wouldn't want it to, I hope it wouldn't have had any sort of real sort of detrimental effect to them. Hopefully what I would have told myself is, oh, well, they don't give a fuck. They, they think you're a fuckwit. You know, they'll, they'll get over it. You're a fuckwit. And again, self-deprecating. <laughs> Me talking negatively, negatively about myself um, as a coping mechanism to some extent. Um, 
which would lead me to self-love, which is something that has kind of been um, suggested to me. Um, and even in a way, I kind of feel funny about it, just saying self-love. Like, oh. Because what's repeatedly come up for me um, from my peers, especially this year, is that I'm really hard on myself. Um, I'm really hard on myself. I don't really give myself credit for what I've managed to accomplish in these last five years. You know, there's times where I feel like, you know, me and the guy five years ago, mentally, I haven't moved an inch. Um, and so people will say, you know, you need to talk kinder to yourself. You need to give yourself more self-love. Um, because if you're not going to love yourself, you know, you can't expect anyone else to. We should be in a place where you love yourself so much that any other external love you receive is just a bonus. And I guess that's a really, um, it's been a really challenging thing for, for me. Um, and even though it sounds so simple, it really does. It's really, it's really sounds so simple. Just talk kindly to yourself. Like, why can't, why can't you just be nice to yourself? You know, you're doing okay. You are a good person. Just st stop talking to yourself like you're a dickhead, <laughs> you know? And, and that extends to, you know, receiving love. Like I struggle to receive love as well. And it's probably um, been a detriment to me with sort of romantic relationships because then, yeah, like if I'm not able to receive love, then I'm not going to be at the capacity to be able to let a woman into my life because any woman that tries to get close to me, it's kind of just, you're just like, what are you doing? <laughs> just come on, you got better, you know, and then it's the self-deprecating again. It's just like, you know, come on, you, you, me, you, you gotta have, you gotta have better taste than that. So, um, that's the sort of stuff that I guess has been at the forefront of, um, my issues this year is trying to, I guess, believe that I can be okay being me, that, that the past is in the past. I don't, I don't. It's there to remind me of where I don't want to be anymore. But where do I want to go? Um, that isn't, um, that path isn't paved for me. It isn't for anyone. We don't know where we're going to go, where we're going to end up. I mean, and some would say that's the beauty of life. It's, um, it's stepping into the unknown. And I guess... You know, you have to find purpose. You know, a person without purpose will distract themselves with pleasure. And I, I'm prime candidate for that. <laughs> There's plenty of evidence that I partook in that for many years with drinking. If I took drugs, abuse, pornography, casual sex, you know, even now, like food, social media, is, it's endless, you know. There has to be something more. And I guess my struggle is believing that I have the capacity and the capability to strive and achieve a purposeful life that I will be happy and satis satisfied with, that I can have the strength within me to go out and work my ass off to get it. It's quite a daunting thought to think about. Because, yeah, there is fear of failure. There's, you know, oh, well, what makes you think that you can do it? You know, I struggle with resistance to to change to because it, it, it becomes like overwhelming. 
And then when I get overwhelmed with things, then that's when inaction happens and indecisiveness. And then you just stay put, you just stay where you are. And, you know, time's running out. You need to, you need to get a move on. Um, you haven't got much time left. You know, it's just like you're 32. It's like, yeah, I'm 32. I've wasted my twenties, but, um, which again, that sort of thinking doesn't help. It doesn't help to sort of think like that because all it does is make you agitated and get, and, and give you anxiety. And anxiety is like another thing that I'm learning about within myself. Like, I don't know if I ever really dealt, dealt with anxiety when I was drinking, possibly because I was drinking. I was just masking it with the alcohol, you know? And now I've, I've, I have episodes of, of that now to deal with. And again, it's just like, oh, fuck, it's another fucking... Oh, another headache. <laughs> but yeah, and I mean to, you know, to go back to with depression, you know, I've always said that depression is like you're treading water and the water's up to your chin and your feet are in cinder blocks weighing you down, trying to get you underwater and you're just treading water, trying to breathe, trying to survive. It's heavy. It can get really heavy and um, and that's the power of your mind because it is, it's mental. It's a, the power of your mind to affect you mentally to the point where, yeah, like you can, it can affect you physically. Um, it, you know, the power of your mind mentally can affect your behaviors externally. It's... It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy thing. And, you know, what sucks, I guess for me, I'm always just trying to look for that. I just want the, the one answer. There's got to be the one answer that's going to work. And it's not the case. There's, you just got to keep trying multiple different things until something, something works. Or you have this hope and belief that something will work and something will stick. And, you work to strive to get better and make yourself open to loving yourself, to receiving love from others, to give love to others and live a purposeful life with meaning, um, have direction, have goals you want to achieve. Um, and grow as a person. You don't want to be the same person you were a year ago. I certainly don't. You know, I've been told I say I don't know a lot because I don't want to look. I've been told oftentimes it gets worse before it gets better. The shit that I'm going through is happening to me or for me, I guess. Um, and I guess in, in some ways, maybe I still need to add more good habits in and remove bad habits. Because it was a thing I think in the episode I think I did with Clinton, he talked about you know, you can remove the bad habits, but you still need to put something in that space. You know, you remove the bad habit and then just leave the space. Then the space just ruminates and then you just start overthinking and dwelling and then thinking, fuck, you can't handle it. Let me bring the old habit back in to, to relieve me. Um, you need to remove the bad habit and then put a better habit in. Um Well, this has been an interesting experience to just sit here and talk to the camera on my own. Um, I hope you got something out of it. It's quite therapeutic for me. <laughs> um, but I think we'll leave it at that for this time around. And maybe it's something we could explore again soon together. 
Um, so this has been the Last Drinks podcast. I'm Will Hitchens, and I will see you in the next one. Thank <laughs> you.